I'm Trish Schulte. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a professor and Canada Research Chair in the Department of Zoology at the University of British Columbia. I grew up in Vancouver and I went to UBC as an undergraduate. And um, after I finished my undergraduate, I took a year off to try and decide what I wanted to do. But I decided I definitely wanted to do science. So I came back to UBC and I did a master's degree in the same department where I did my undergrad. And then after that, I went to Stanford University to do a PhD. And I worked at the Hopkins Marine Station in California, which was beautiful. And I had a chance to kind of work in the um, intertidal environment. And then after that, I took a faculty position at the University of Waterloo, where I was there for four years. And then I moved back to UBC as an assistant professor. So in general, my lab studies how the factors that influence intraspecific variation in the responses to environmental stressors in fish, so differences among individuals. And we're particularly interested in understanding what it is that it makes some individuals very resilient or able to, to withstand environmental stressors and other individuals less resilient. And this variation is super important because it's the substrate on which natural selection can act. And so it's sort of at the very beginnings of evolutionary physiology, microevolution. So those are the questions we're interested in broadly. So how did I get there? How did I come to that as a set of questions? And it's actually a really long story. And it starts right back at my undergrad. In my undergrad classes, I took a lot of um, courses in comparative physiology. And I found that fascinating. But I also took a bunch of courses in developmental biology and molecular biology. And that was a very long time ago. And back then, we were only just starting to understand how genes relate to phenotype, and so how changes in genes could relate to phenotype. And I remember one time in my third year as an undergrad, I went to a lecture about a set of genes called Hox genes, where if you mutated those genes, you could cause these massive differences in phenotype. So you could grow, um, in a Drosophila, you could grow a leg out of the eye or you know these kind of big big changes and that made me start to think about the idea that you could make a connection between genetic variation in the environment evolution and then the patterns of variation we see in physiological traits from my physiology courses so right back then it, i decided that that sort of the overall area i wanted to study and then in my masters i did a project that was mostly about um, exercise metabolism, so the biochemical basis of, of, of um, recovery from exercise in fish. But one of the things I noticed when I was doing that project was how different different individuals were and how much variation there was. Some individuals could swim really fast, other individuals were really not so good. And that's when I started to think about this idea of not the huge changes, not the you know eyes grow, legs growing out of an eye or whatever, but, but the small differences that make some individuals better performers than others. And so I sought out a place where I could do a PhD looking at those kinds of questions. And so what I looked at was um, variation among individuals within a, a, a species, of actually across populations, in regulation of, uh, of a number of genes. And I've more or less been working on that question ever since. So what are the genetic variants that, and the mechanisms that lead to variation and how well fishes respond to environmental stressors? And right now we're focusing mostly on things like temperature and low oxygen because these are really important environmental changes that are occurring as a result of climate change. But over the years, the lab has also worked, at, uh, worked on changes in salinity and um, uh, various types of toxicants, and, and a wide range of other things. So the projects in my lab are super diverse, and we use a really wide range of methods. So everything from whole animal physiology to a lot of molecular biology and that kind of thing. and. Um, so a lot of the work that we do, especially in the molecular biology area, means taking existing techniques and applying them in a new system. And one of the techniques we're using quite a bit right now is called RNA-seq or uh, RNA sequencing. So where you're sequencing 
every RNA that's expressed in a tissue. And that gives us a sense of the overall patterns of um, gene expression in, in a tissue. Um, often we do this in response to an environmental stressor. So we might take a fish and expose it to high temperature and ask what genes are changing in response to that high temperature. So we do that a lot. The other thing we're very excited about at the moment is DNA methylation. So methylation is a modification to, to the DNA that doesn't change the DNA sequence, but it does change the three-dimensional structure of the DNA, and that affects how well the genes in that DNA are transcribed. And so we're using a variety of methods to detect changes in methylation in response to changes in the environment. We did an experiment a couple of years ago with stickleback where what we did was we took mother sticklebacks and exposed them to stress. And then we took the babies and we, um, their, their, the, their eggs, the, the eggs from the, the stressed mother, and crossed them to unstressed fathers and then grew them up. And so we had some control fish where the mothers had not been stressed and some fish where the mothers had been stressed. And we grew them up to adults. And from other work, it was known that fish from stressed mothers have different behavior from fish from unstressed mothers. And so we were interested in what changes in gene expression might, um, might be related to those changes in behavior. And when we did the experiment, when we first looked at the results, we couldn't figure it out at all. The patterns weren't at all what we expected. We did not see a huge effect of maternal stress, the stress of the mother on the brain gene expression in the offspring. Instead, what we saw was this really interesting pattern where in the statistics, what we detected was a very strong interaction between the effect of maternal stress and the sex of the offspring. So the pattern in the gene expression was that for thousands of genes, there were ones that were affected by the stress, of the uh, stress that happened in the mother in males. And then there was another set of genes that were strongly affected by whether or not there was stress in mothers, but only in females. So what that told us was maternal stress causes huge effects on gene expression, both those in the brain, but those effects are completely different between male and female offspring. So, and that was a huge surprise because no one had ever done any experiments looking at both male and female offspring. People had, almost all the previous experiments had done, been done only on male offspring. And that's often done in behavior studies to reduce the amount of variation because there's lots of, 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 of sex-based variation. So we weren't anticipating there, there would be any effect of sex. And there it was. It was huge. The male and female offspring were responding completely differently to uh, maternal stress. And subsequent work in other labs has shown that, in fact, the behavioral effects really differ in male and female offspring. There are effects in both, but they're different between the sexes. And that was... A big surprise, and um, it's also really changed the way we do work in the lab because most of the time physiologists don't think too much about the sex of their animals, especially in fish where it can be hard to tell what sex they are at a lot of life stages. And so there may be all kinds of things that are hiding out there that are different between males and females that we have just never thought about. And so that's something that's really changed the way we think about things. One of the things about research is the way you think about stuff is always changing. So, so you're pivoting and rethinking all the time. And for me, one of the things that I'm quite excited about right now is sort of over the course of my career, I've mostly thought of myself as a basic or fundamental scientist that's asking questions about the way the world works, but not so much in an applied context. And recently, the lab has become very focused on addressing important conservation questions. And this is partly motivated by the fact that we see that the world is changing around us and we see fish populations declining and, and we see the climate changing. And we have to think about what are we gonna do about this? Is there something that biologists can do to help? And so for me, that's kind of a big pivot in terms of fundamental way I think about things 
because I've always thought about science as, as just a, a as as really a curiosity based endeavor, it's something where we learn about the world. And I haven't thought of myself so much as an applied scientist, but the lab is really making a transition in that in that respect. And so right now we're just about to begin a big project on the impact of road salt on salmon and streams. Because in the winter we use, here in Vancouver, we use quite a lot of salt on the roads because it's cold here, but not that cold. So salt works, it is, it, you know, works well. But that salt runs into streams. And in the winter, salmon eggs are developing in their nests and then the baby salmon are emerging. And that salt is stressful for these salmon. So the question is, is the salt that's running off into the streams right now bad enough to, uh, to damage the salmon? And so we're asking questions about that. And so that's a very direct, very applied problem, but it draws on all of the fundamental knowledge that we've gained from our curiosity-based science. So, so that's one way of thinking about things differently at the very big, broad picture. And so what I like best about my job is that every day I come in and it's something different. I'm doing something different every day. That's also a downside because when you're doing all these different things, it's hard to um, feel like you're doing a good job at all of them. And a lot of the time you feel like you don't know what you're doing and you have to be comfortable with that. In fact, just in general, as a scientist, you have to learn to be comfortable with uncertainty because when you're trying to push back the frontiers of knowledge, it's inevitable that you won't know how things are, you know, how things are going to go, right? Because if we already could perfectly predict the results of our experiments, then almost you don't need to do them because you have a full understanding of what's going on. The most exciting stuff is when you don't quite understand what's going on and, and you have to think about um, what it means and what the experiment would be to help you distinguish between different possibilities. And I love that sense of uncertainty and the, uh, the ability to find new things. So in some ways that's that moment when you suddenly understand something that you didn't understand before, and maybe that nobody understood before, is an incredibly exciting feeling. And that's what gets me out of bed every morning.